Okay, um, I, um, I think we'll start. Uh, hi everyone, um, and welcome to our fourth Scenes of Shame and Stigma in COVID-19 seminar. Um, today we have Ray Erica, uh, an honorary fellow at the University of Exeter's Welcome Centre for Cultures and Environments of Health. Ray has previously been a career civil servant at the Department of Health. Uh, he was secretary to the Independent Inquiry into Health Inequalities in 1997 and 1998, and he chaired the EU Equity Action Programme on Health Inequalities between 2011 and 2014. Ray will be speaking today on shame and stigma, the dark side of COVID policymaking, after which we'll take questions. Ray. Great, thanks Fred. Um, and thank you for the uh, opportunity to contribute to this, uh, this series. Um, and I hope that uh, my uh, background as a, a former policymaker at the uh, Department of Health will add uh, an extra dimension to the proceedings thus far. So when we were developing this series during the third lockdown, my first thought was the dissonance between rhetoric uh, and action in response to the coronavirus. In the beginning, we were going to biff the virus, see it off within 12 weeks because we're all in this together, somebody once said. Later came the blaming and shaming, a harder narrative which pointed the finger at the guilty ones. Fred, can we have the first slide, please? Thank you. Thank you. You'll be pleased to know that uh, there are only five slides, so it's not going to be a series of this. But this particular um, poster, which the NHS produced, um, at the beginning of this year in February, um, really summed up the answer, uh, the issue about um, shame and, and stigma, because it says in this poster very clearly that uh, we know who's to blame for this desperate situation this poor woman is in, uh, and the answer is, it's you, it's your fault. Thank you, Fred, that's great. Of course, all governments like to blame someone else, shaming people to achieve this effect is always tempting, but it doesn't have to be like this. The uh, UK HIV AIDS policies in the 1980s eschewed this approach, where policymakers emphasised the general threat, aware of divisiveness, the divisiveness the shaming approach could provoke. This tension, tension between policies that seek to include people by working together and those that exclude them, uh, shaming and stigmatizing them is a key test for policymakers. Health inequalities, the health gap between different groups, was my um, area of interest at the department. And it was at a conference in February 2020, marking 10 years on from Michael Marmot's Health Inequalities Review, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, that attention was beginning to turn to this new virus. The last 18 months has shown that health inequalities and COVID are closely intertwined. After 130,000 plus deaths and millions of infections, only in the UK, the Subriquet Plague Island, it's no surprise that people and the communities at the wrong end of the health gap have been the hardest hit. From the first, ONS returns show death rates twice as high in poorer areas. WHO remind us that health is more than the absence of disease. And I favor a health perspective that reflects the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And while the policy focus has been on the disease since March, 2020, it has meant that wider health consequences have become a bit of a footnote, observed, noted, but largely passed over each time there are new developments in, with the disease, like the emergence of new variants and resistance to vaccines and so forth. So issues like the growing gap in school performance, the impact of mental health, especially on younger people, and the burgeoning NHS waiting lists have had to take second place. Events, especially crises like COVID, uh, are an opportunity as well as a cause of concern. It can reshape priorities, redirect resources in unexpected directions. But fear and anxiety can make it hard to win acceptance for inclusive health-based policies. A lack of preparedness can aggravate the situation. Uh, 
making blaming and shaming easier. And this can undermine people's self-confidence. It gets them to worry about the wrong things, about individual rather than structural failings. And it secures their collusion in blaming the victim. This is the dark side of policymaking. The tension between individual and social responsibility tests the role of public bodies, meeting acknowledged public needs against the arrangements made by individuals and families to meet their own needs. Consent is crucial to identifying public needs. Self-reliance is an important part of a successful society. The risk is, however, it opens the door to a stigmatizing approach. And COVID is just the latest example of how this uh, tension plays out. Stigmatizing and shaming have contributed to the high price we've paid in cases, hospitalization and deaths. And the light shone on individuals and groups who, quote, fail to follow the rules, refuse to, quote, stay safe and put the rest of, the, rest of us at risk, is a convenient distraction for, from and cover for uh, wider policy omissions and failures. Pointing the finger avoids the need for clear, consistent messaging, transparent decision making between hard choices. This is not to load the blame on policymakers for what's happened over the last 18 months. Um, many commentators have praised the commitment, honesty, and integrity of officials. But COVID presents unenviable choices for policymakers across the globe, which are made more difficult by uncertain evidence about causes transmissions and the efficacy of actions in tackling it. The reference points for pol politicians and officials at navigating the policy process are three types mainly. The first, wait and see, involves no rush to judgment, a case of seeing developments unfold and then, and only then, doing as little to correct the situation as possible. This hands-off approach avoids upsetting a system working well, but is less satisfactory where it is not working or is faced with a serious and unexpected challenge. The opposite to wait and see is, of course, the something, anything must be done approach characterized by a headless chicken. Secondly, there's the art of the possible about the business of government and how issues are handled within its confines. A question of squaring the circle between priorities, resources, and parliamentary pressures. This approach emerged after World War II with the creation of the welfare state, where policy is about balance, a managerial rather than an ideological question. And then more recently, we've had evidence-based policy approaches, which places greater emphasis on performance, with evidence and data to guide and monitor the process. This provides reassurance on effectiveness when delivery becomes the key as policy ambitions become larger and resources more strained. But while we are told that an evidence-based approach has held sway throughout the pandemic, for example, we're following the science, that well-worn phrase, it seems like, all, like elements of all these approaches have been used. Sometimes it seems all at the same time. Officials are only too well aware of the gaps and weaknesses in these approaches and the wishful thinking they can encourage. Hence the concerted effort to raise the Whitehall policy game over the past few years, making it more systematic, effective and responsive to need. Thus policies need to be clear and transparent, where clarity is all and the language understandable, consistent, where it avoids ambiguity or contradiction within a policy or piece of legislation, and coherent, providing a fit with, within the common purpose of wider policy action. Equally, policies must, as far as possible, anticipate events, be timely and proportionate, delivering in a way that matches current need, and be on a suitable scale to have an impact on an issue. They must also engage others so that policies have resonance beyond the political class and beware to the unintended consequence of policies. So a pretty extensive shopping list. However, 
When faced with the uh, reality of COVID, and despite these efforts to sharpen up policy making process, processes, something went wrong at the outset of the pandemic. Although the pandemic was a significant challenge, its arrival was not unexpected. We even had a name for it, disease X. SARS and the H1N1 virus uh, posed infectious disease challenges in the first decade of the 21st century, on which the 2011 film Contagion was based. And you know it's serious when Kate Winslet dies before the final reel. There was MERS and Ebola. The 100th anniversary of the 1918 flu outbreak was marked by a BBC London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine simulation of the spread of a highly infectious flu. It asked what might happen, how many might die, and it gave worrying answers. We were, however, reassured. We were told pandemic flu was at the top of the government's rich risk register. The policy makers had a plan in their back pocket. But when D disease X became real, policymakers were outflanked by the pace, pace of developments in early 2020, by the welter of fear, uncertainty and confusion, and by the rising numbers of deaths, and in particular the bodies piling up in Italy. But there was no response, no rush to action. Instead, the policy process seemed to freeze into a case of wait and see, marked by a rather querulous tone of disbelief that it could ever happen here. The truth was, and all accounts agree, we didn't have a plan, at least not one worthy of the name. We hadn't learned the lessons from the official simulations, notably Plan Cygnus in 2016, or made good the flaws the plan identified. This was an embarrassment compounded by a lack of openness, and it took an information commissioner's ruling to admit what had happened. Secondly, efforts to achieve a more measured and systematic approach to policy development were discarded in the confusion. Instead, we had an improvised, a something, anything must be done approach, which seemed to many that we made it up as we went along. The result was confused lines of accountability, who's in charge, question mark, a lack of leadership, and mixed messaging to accompany this situation. The idiosyncratic nature of the English approach was noted by WHO, and perhaps best summed up by the comedian Matt Lucas in his broadcast to the nation as Prime Minister at the beginning of the pandemic. He said, don't go to work, go to work, stay at home, don't stay at home, and so on, all summed up within less than 30 seconds. Even the newspapers agreed he spoke for a baffled nation. Blaming and shaming helped fill the gap and distracted, from the pub, distracted the public from what was going on. Sadly, at a cost of poorer health, more miserable lives and an earlier death for those individuals and families affected, mostly the oldest, the poorest and the most vulnerable. It subverted the message that we're all in this together and sought to achieve compliance by attention on people and on groups of people who, for whatever reason, failed to comply with the rules. This approach intensified as numbers rose along with public anxiety. Can we have slide two, Fred, please? This is an interesting slide because uh, it was published in uh, on the 2nd of April 2020, it was superseded what had been previously the campaign in March, which was basically a public information uh, approach, just setting out the, the facts, a, a complete uh, change of tone. Of course, you'll recall that at the beginning of March, the Prime Minister was busy shaking hands with everybody. Uh, and uh, by the end of March, he was diagnosed with COVID. I'm not suggesting there's any link between these two things, but uh, there's the new harder, harder faced um, uh, campaign, um, which uh, then uh, from which events then develop. OK, thank you, Fred. That's that's good. Um, turning to um, shame and social policy in the wider sense, uh, 
the modern role of shame and stigma in social policy, blaming the victim, goes back to the 1834 Poor Law Amendment Act. Its guiding principles of deterrence and less eligibility uh, were applied to the relief of poverty, especially for the undeserving poor. Its symbol was the workhouse and it cast a long shadow. It put a fear of falling to hard times in the hearts of almost everyone. Dickens, Hardy and others uh, captured its harshness, cruelty and demoralization. It may seem a long time ago, but even today we hear of politicians espousing Victorian values. For those people who couldn't be accommodated in the workhouse, outdoor relief was offered to people in need, including the sick and dying. Accepting such relief meant loss of civic rights. This was designed to enforce the stigma and encourage self-reliance. Conferring stigma on recipients of medical care was both demeaning and, as the 19th century progressed, counterproductive. Increasingly, the poor law was seen as irrelevant to the needs of modern industrial society, and this emboldened those seeking change. The Medical Relief Disqualification Act of 1885 restored these rights to the recipients of medical aid under outdoor relief, but it proved a long, hard battle to win these rights in practice. The desire to pauperise poor law recipients ran deep in Victorian and post-Victorian Britain. And it was not until 1948 when a new spirit of universalism and citizenship was ushered in, symbolised by the NHS, that the institutional shaming of the poor law was finally broken. Shame hung heavy over policies on sexual health. It was a ready-made source of stigma, a sense reinforced by the atmosphere of the poor law and later by concerns about health of the race. This was amplified by the impact of war in 1914-18 and a rising incidence of venereal disease among soldiers, which threatened military efficiency. It provoked an, quote, an almost revolutionary change in the attitude of the public towards VD. Policymakers introduced new government regulations in 1917, which insisted local authorities provide free diagnosis, care and treatment without stigma, largely at the taxpayer's expense. Shame and stigma were set aside in this instance for the public good in a way that prefigured the NHS. Now, while VD may not be considered, may be considered more endemic than pandemic, there's no mistake about HIV AIDS. Once recognized, it provoked a strong public health policy response. Basically, it was about going in early, going in hard to counter the effects of the pandemic and to learn from what other people were doing in other countries. There was also in the UK at least, a determined rejection of stigmatizing people. The rising case numbers and the initial black government responsiveness prompted a determination to address the issue and champion a hard hitting campaign. At first, it was at first, this is a surprising step from a socially conservative government that introduced, subsequently introduced section 28, which prohibited, quote, the promotion of homosexuality, unquote, in schools only a couple of years later. But the risks of the pandemic were sufficiently understood by the key players, as was the need for a strong public health message. They realized that it was better to overreact than ignore the disease despite efforts to dilute the message on moral grounds. This brings us to COVID and the gaps in our policy defensive. It seems the best prepared, or perhaps second best prepared nation for a pandemic was brought low by gaps in our defenses, by a lack of humility and a denial of responsibility. In reality, and as we've seen, planning and preparedness was deficient policymakers were distracted, experts conflicted, and the public health infrastructure underfunded. The lessons from the HIV AIDS uh, program were ignored. Instead, it was to be a war to the death with the virus, with the virus to be sent packing within 12 weeks. Even as cases 
and uh, cases and deaths spiraled out of control. As numbers continued to rise, an explanation was sought not in the actions of the government who had followed the science, but in the actions and omissions of the people, blaming, quote, the irresponsibility of individuals, unquote, rather than a policy or systems failure. This was a much more acceptable way forward, not least given the list of failures, the slow response to the outbreak, the failure to provide PPE, to deliver on test and trace, or to protect care home residents. Similarly, individual behavior, focus on individual behavior, was an easier target than facing up to the rising tide of health inequalities and deteriorating working and living conditions that accompanied the pandemic. Ministers were clear, however, it was the careless attitude of individuals to lock down rules and regulations that was responsible for the rising incidence of the disease. And PR and advertising campaigns were harnessed to the cause. So Fred, can we have um, slide three, please? Um, and uh, this slide um, takes us back to the beginning in a sense, uh, because you'll recognize the first of those slides uh, as the one, one we saw then. This look him, look her in the eyes um, ability, um, as I said, was published in February, middle of February this year, uh, when we had um, 9,488 cases in, uh, on the day of the 13th of February. We were in the third lockdown uh, with a vaccine rollout underway, and a week later, Prime Minister announced a roadmap out of lockdown. In other words, light at the end of the tunnel, but individuals were being reminded in a very vivid way of their uh, responsibilities. So thank you, Fred, uh, for that. So from the beginning, the public was asked, public was recruited to identify transgressors, the fifth columnists among us. They were asked to, quote, do the right thing, unquote and call the police if they suspected neighbours were breaking the rules. Fines of up to £10,000 were introduced. Humberside police set up a phone line, quote, so residents can shop each other for virus spreading, unquote. Curtains twitched and drones were dispatched. Two people were fined by police for drinking coffee in the Derbyshire National Park and shamed in the national media. A family from Rotherham was warned by police about playing in their front garden and told to stay inside. You risk social approbation, even moral outrage, by visiting a beach, a park, having a barbecue, or even being outside. Commentators speculated on the emergence of a snitch or a Stasi-like culture. They took Parliament's Human Rights Committee to call out this approach, describing the fines enforced, over 110,000 of them, as muddled, discriminatory, and unfair, that both that, that criminalized the poor over the better off. People deemed insufficiently attentive to the ever-changing rules and regulations, and with the worst living and health, uh, health and living conditions, were rewarded by local lockdowns supported by the science, so we were told. This science was used to condemn the guilty not least in the Northwest. Manchester's shame was augmented when their mayor protested about the way the COVID policy response had been mishandled and failed to meet local needs. The approach of singling out the worst offenders with the highest rates, like Bolton or Leicester, continued to distract from wider policy failures. This is not to say that these areas were not in a bad position but restricting lives merely widened inequalities, damaged opportunities, undermined mental health, making a bad situation worse and pushing poorer areas further into decay. Shaming inhibited basic questioning about what was going wrong. What was worse, these, uh, these local lockdowns didn't even work because as we know from looking at position today, they still have some of the highest rates of COVID. So despite threats that, quote, more may have to be done, quote, if the rules aren't followed, successive surveys showed high levels of public compliance, quote, 
casting doubt on claims that rule breaking is contributing to a rise in COVID deaths, unquote, even in the hardest hit areas. It was estimated that lockdown rules have been changed 64 times by the beginning of 2021. So not surprisingly, very few people understood the rules completely. And even ministers and senior policymakers got entangled in their complexity. It frayed public consent, undermined the power of the rules and raised suspicions that the rules were just for the little people. In other words, people like us. In fact, a picture emerges of a society at least trying to act as one with people wanting to play their part, but let down by confusion and mixed messaging. And even as the rules relaxed, the government faced both ways. Can we have to slide four, please, Fred? And this slide, uh, which was actually used earlier in the campaign, was uh, re rephrased uh, for the position um, after we had left the uh, third stage out of lockdown in May, which happened on the 17th of May. This poster uh, appeared on the 22nd of May when we had 1,645 cases. Of course, the third stage of lockdown ended the rule of six and allowed people indoors, but as you can see, the government still suggesting that um, people should meet outdoors instead. So again, a confusion about what people are supposed to and expected to do. So thank you for that. So instead of promoting a we're all, in, we're all in this together approach, as we said, divisiveness and exclusion has been preferred. And the focus has been on the relatively small number of non-compliers which has generated considerable um, anxiety about the public, among the public about the right thing to do. The vaccination programme was, of course, supposed to offer relief to the pressures of the pandemic, and of course, in many ways, it succeeded brilliantly in doing that. But even here, stigma and shaming featured. Antisocial attitudes were identified among individuals and communities who were hesitant or unsure including people living in the poorer parts of London, young people, BME people, close-knit families living in overcrowded conditions. In fact, many of the groups highlighted in Michael Marmot's 2010 report we referred to at the beginning. The focus on shaming individuals is a barrier to understanding that COVID holds up a mirror to the condition of Britain, with PHE reporting falling life and healthy life expectancy and the further widening of health inequalities. In fact, the evidence of selfishness was, quote, very thin, unquote. So instead of providing an opportunity to learn and work together, it promoted anxiety and a lack of confidence in public institutions among the people who were already feeling vulnerable, the very factors that have prevented a wider take up of the vaccination programme. Everyone recognizes the challenge COVID presents for policymakers, but measured against the standards set out at the beginning of this talk, uh, the policy process has been found wanting. Blaming the victim instead of acknowledging shortcomings in the system has inhibited proper scrutiny of the policy process and has been used to deflect calls for, firstly, pressures for a clear and explicit strategy and subsequently calls for a public inquiry. It has also exposed further the tension between individual and social responsibility, risked excluding more people from the mainstream of society, and it's also failed to seize the opportunity to improve people's health and living conditions. Used thoughtfully, a more open approach could have provided a foundation for the building back better agenda establishing a rationale for change and development. A strategy joining up all of government was never published. Its absence betrayed a lack of conviction and an unwillingness to engage the public. When asked to share its thinking, the government response was described as, quote, defensive, even shirty, unquote. And this has carried through into a lack of coherence 
in policy development and delivery. Some policies have worked better than others, such as furlough, but have tended to operate independently of each other with little or no fit between them. Witness the catch-22 over sick pay and the call for self-isolation. Clarity and transparency have been conspicuous by their absence. This was clear in the handling of evidence, where headlines and slogans prevailed over the complexities and uncertainties of reality. And in taking expert advice, where the government has blown hot and cold, varying between scepticism and uncritical acceptance. The timeliness and scale of any policy response is crucial to its effect. But in this case, it was slow and reactive. Despite compelling evidence about an approaching tsunami of disease, clear and effective plans could have helped. But unlike the earlier HIV AIDS pandemic, there was a reluctance to show humility in the face of the unknown and learn from others. To conclude, the narrative has now changed in recent months, in the last couple of months, notwithstanding high, if uh, fluctuating, case numbers, and thankfully a lesser, though still substantial, rate of hospitalization and deaths. The message seems to be the pandemic is over. COVID is effectively an endemic disease. We can and will live with it. We'll just keep vaccinating as many people as possible. They're usually the same ones over and over again. The tone seems to have softened as COVID is displaced in the headlines by other pressing issues. While less threatening than before, individuals are still urged to exercise caution. Yet confusion remains about the messaging with, with people warned that their irresponsibility could put, behave, could put these gains at risk. So can we have the final slide? Fred, please. <clears throat> and this is the one on face coverings uh, published um, after the uh, exit from lockdown in July. This was published on the 22nd of, of July. Um, and it does recall what Matt, Matt Lucas was saying earlier about wear a mask, don't wear a mask. People again confused between on the one hand being told masks were no longer necessary, but we should still wear them anyway. So thanks Fred for that. So just finally, um, this is not the first pandemic we've suffered and it won't be the last. COVID is not even, quote, the bad one, unquote. Jeremy Farrer in his book, Strike, notes we could get something much worse next time. Where, for example, the burden of disease is borne by the young, not the old, to crippling effect as it was in the 1918 flu pandemic. We need to understand how we can be better prepared by raising our policy game and by emphasizing openness and transparency in preference to blaming and shaming. Building a better, fairer society, more resistant to pandemics of the future, and one that promotes better health and welfare, welfare of its citizens without shame and stigma, they'll have to wait a bit longer. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ray, for just an incredibly rich and, and thought-provoking paper. Um, I, I'm going to open it up to questions um, now, if that's all right. I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll ask people um, to raise their hands uh, digitally if that's okay so if, if you're new to zoom then there's a kind of well if you're new to zoom then lucky you um but there's a kind of a, a bar at the bottom um, which includes a little smiley face with reactions if you click on that there's a button that says raise hand um it's mostly a selfish thing it's it's a lot easier for me to see who's who's putting their hand up if you do it that way so if, if anyone has any questions then, then please do raise your hand that, that way thank you I, uh, I think I might um, exercise my, my privilege as chair and, and, and ask kind of one of the many, many questions I have. <laughs> um, I'm, um, 
I'm always kind of obviously that these, these these things are are always going to be opaque in some ways, but I'm hoping you might have more kind of insight than, than me. I'm always interested in, in in kind of how you get to some things like those uh, those those kind of posters you shared, you know, this this very visceral kind of you know look them in the eyes kind of stuff. I mean, is I suppose my question is about how shame is thought of in the processes that result in in messaging like that like it, uh, i mean i'm simplifying but are people kind of saying okay look i've come up with this idea it's fantastic we're going to shame them yeah. you know yeah. Or, or, yeah. Or, or is this a yeah. kind of like a structural inattention to shame as a as a kind of unintentional consequence i mean it's, it's obviously difficult to second guess in particular cases but i mean how how is shame thought of is it still mm. Is it seen as like a viable a viable tool, I suppose, or is it something that that kind of emerges when when people aren't uh, sensitive to it? Yeah, no, I think I mean that that that's a good question, and it's always a, um, a, a, a consideration because, of course, the difference between, if you like, uh, intentional and unintentional uh, shaming is, I think, you know, very relevant to this and to and to other. Uh, policy areas. I mean, I quoted the, um, the 1834 Poor Law uh, uh, Amendment Act, which was explicitly about um, shaming, very deliberately and intentionally about that. Uh, I think um, when we look at COVID, it's actually a little bit more uh, ambiguous. Um, uh, and I think that um, it's, I mean, obviously the process is, um, these are produced not by policymakers, but by um, PR companies who are commissioned by policymakers to produce material. So uh, I think that that probably reflects the sharpness of tone uh, of some of the uh, particular posters. But I think there's no doubt that um, it, uh, it it was in the thoughts of people that um, individuals are uh, the um, are the uh, you know are the focus of this campaign? It's about it's about uh, individuals, and it's not about drawing attention to you know government policies or government failings or government difficulties. And so I think what happens in this situation, uh, and I've I've been involved in one or two of these things, is that uh, the brief when it, when it's drawn up will be very uh, public faced. We'll be looking at the the people outside talking to them about various public health messages, placing the responsibility with them. And I mean, you can go back and you can look at things like smoking or alcohol or all those other messages. And the emphasis is on the individual consumer rather than say, well, how do we tackle the tobacco companies or something like that? And I think again, with this, the focus was individuals who are not obeying the rules these are the people we need to deal with. And if we can deal with those, that will sort the problem. Well, I mean, clearly that wasn't the case at all. Um, yeah, there we go. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> Little message there from Martin. But um, so I think I think that's how I would I would uh, describe. And people can get, you know, if meetings you have to produce these things can, can get quite excitable, which actually then that ups the ante. And we get these fantastic pieces of artwork because I mean they are brilliant pieces of artwork that we've uh, seen today. Okay, oh, thank you, thank you, Ray. Um, I I should say as well. Sorry, I completely forgot to. But please, if you don't want to, um, if you don't want to kind of ask a question verbally, then then please also you can post things in the chat and, and I'll read them out. Um, we we did briefly have a question, but I, I think the the questioner has gone. Um, does anyone does anyone else have uh, something they'd like to ask? Ah, we've got a hand from Martin. Go on, Martin. Um, ah, sorry, thanks, Ray. That was a wonderful paper. I, I mean, this isn't entirely fully formed, and I suppose in some respects, I'm I'm trying to relate it to sort of cultures of shame. But I suppose in some ways, it's more about the policy making process and the extent to which obviously there are so many actors involved yeah. in producing it from the kind of civil servants to the ministers to the part political parties themselves um in and then whether you see the kind of inertia the kind of mixture of the, the typologies in some ways that you had about the different styles of policy making as emerging from precisely that kind of 
um, uh, mixture of actors involved. And I, and, I, and I knew some people in the civil service during the sort of early response, and a lot of their mm. responses were, even though they were working on policy areas which weren't initially COVID related, oh, I really want to get redeployed, so I need to be doing something. Mm. Mm. Uh, then meeting obviously the kind of uncertainty in many ways in the ministerial positions and then kind of trying to marry up those that different way of working so I wonder to some extent whether some of this as results is, is where that kind of rush to action meets the inertia and then you kind of re result in almost a kind of a default position that in some ways reflects a broader individualistic culture I suppose around pu public health particularly I'm sort of thinking about the ways that risk has, has generally been mobilized yeah. around those ideas of individual desire or, or shame yeah yeah no I mean I think you know one of the things about this is as you say that the, the number of actors involved in 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 the COVID uh, has been um, extraordinary um and that does make it make it very complicated especially when you're trying to get some sort of you know coherent approach um, to it, um, because the tendency in you know Whitehall and and policy making generally is is you know it tends to revert to a sort of silo approach, um, you know unless it's forced to act in a more sort of mainstream way, um, and I think you know one of the problems here was um, we never at any point had a an attempt to outline a. A strategy for addressing this issue. I think the lack of a national strategy, a national focus, uh, really sort of inhibited uh, things, and inhibited both the individual actors, you know, from different departments who wanted to engage from people in public health, and in terms of the messages themselves, so that people were rather like the public, were unclear about what the aim of the policy was, you know, what were we pursuing, I mean, there was a Debate earlier in the whole thing. Were we going for a zero type approach or were we going to manage things? And there was never a clear answer, which I think made it um, extremely difficult. So, in some senses, um, you know, that can that can um, almost create um, the sort of inertia you're talking about, almost the inactivity at the same time of people rushing around trying to actually address what is a, a, a critical. Um, challenge so um yeah i think it's it's you know not a, a terribly satisfactory situation and the comparison i draw with aids and hiv is that in aids and hiv you know for all the imperfections and difficulties that that uh, created among policymakers um there were a group of policymakers leaders who basically steered the process and led um, led the fight back, if you like, against the, the terrible um, disease. And these these were, you know, I'm talking about ministerial people primarily, but also senior officials like um, the uh, chief medical officer and people like that. Whereas, you know, if one was to look at, you know, what happened with COVID, I think there's a that that sense. I don't think, you know, was was the same at all. I mean, one of them, you know, I tried not to get to politicize it too much or get involved in, with individual, you know, players, uh, because the, I think the message we're trying to do with here uh, go beyond that. But I think you know, one can't help but compare, in a sense, the energy and well, there's been plenty of energy in, in COVID, although you know, perhaps it hasn't been directed as well as it might. But but on a, an openness and a willingness to learn from others, a humility and an acceptance of people trying to take responsibility with HIV AIDS in the way that perhaps you know hasn't happened with, um, with COVID. So sorry, it's a bit of a long-winded response, but I think you know it, dealing with the, the government machine, the public machine, is is you know is is quite uh, complicated and has many different facets. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, would anyone else like to ask anything? Uh, I, I can take another one. I'm very happy to. <laughs> I, um, Fred, you're a, you're a, you're a, fa a fount of uh, of uh, interesting and and, but, and useful questions. So I'm very happy to. Uh, <laughs> To, to respond. No, I, 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 
wait till you hear it. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I was going to, I really liked um, the, the way you kind of like, you know, took quite a kind of a longer historical lens. Um, so I, I suppose my, my question is like, in terms of thinking about um, cultures of shaming within public health and, and the use of shame in public health, how do you situate this um, historically? Because you, you, I think you talk quite, quite rightly about COVID as you know, um, this something that people were kind of unprepared for. But, but where do you then situate what's undoubtedly been a, a kind of a shaming tendency? I mean, do you see that as going against the grain of a kind of a broadly kind of progressive, um, you know, sort of lack of investment in shame over time, or are you kind of how are you how are you thinking? Do you think this is this is an aberration, or, or where are you with that? Do you think? Yeah. Um, well, it, it's yes. I'm not sure about that whether it's an aberration or not. But what I would say is that when I was talking about the sort of efforts that have been made, you know, this sort of you know uh, the opening years of this century, shall we say, to put it <laughs> portentously to actually improve and systemize, systematize and make more effective the policy making process. I think this was a conscious effort, um, you know, within government to step away from the sort of shaming that comes sometimes unintentionally with, with uh, policy initiatives um, and actually set things in their proper context so that uh, it was a more balanced approach. So that's not to say that you know individuals and families and communities can't you know, you know always do the right thing, but I think it was actually putting the the fact that you know there are several players here and they've all got responsibilities and as policymakers the job is to see the picture in the round and to, to draw on that context to to shape policy. So I think. My hope would have been, and certainly when I was talking about, you know, the the messages that were around the earlier um, potential pandemics at the beginning of the century, the SARS and MERS and so forth, uh, I was extremely conscious of the fact that when SARS was around at the beginning, which was 2002, um, the department was Department of Health was almost in um, in you know wartime mode the amount of activity that was um, put into preparing for the potential of a, a, a rise of such a pandemic was um you know noteworthy to put it mildly um and, you know, some of my colleagues were drafted in to to work on that and there was a real energy and commitment um you know led by the chief medical officer and and, uh, and others and um what i didn't have was uh this time a sense of that energy and, and commitment and direction and clearly people were working extremely hard and committed to doing stuff and you know jeremy farron his book talks about it and others you know talk about it lots of energy and, and effort but i think that lack of perspective in you know um the causes of uh, such crises um and it was disappointing was I would have said that I would have hoped that you know we'd learned from past failures and you know we have got moved beyond perhaps a, a, an entirely sort of shaming approach but in the event it turned out that we hadn't and that that's why I made the the, the comments about the you know from a sort of wait and see you know, manage trying to manage the situation to a, a sort of headless chicken approach, really. Lots of energy, lots of effort, lots of feathers flying everywhere, um, but not really um, grasping the picture in the round, focusing instead on a particular uh, series of issues, blaming and shame. That could say, well, it's not my fault, it's your fault. And that, I think, although I, I, it's not. You know, I'm connected with what's happened before historically. That's disappointing in the sense that we, we you know, we we lost the opportunity to be a little bit more, a little bit more forward-looking, a little bit more progressive. 
Sure, thank you very much. Um, anyone else? Uh, Arthur, please, always, always happy to take a, a question from you. Great. Uh, well, this is this is probably like um, I'm not sure if I've if I've got a question. It's more of a kind of musing, I guess. I mean, what Ray? I, I loved your talk. Thank you very much. Um, I was particularly fascinated in the way that you're, uh, you know, working a little bit with with Fred's previous question. Um, this sort of longer historical approach seems to seems to um, capture a an interesting kind of consistency, I guess, a kind of ideological consistency, for want of a, a perhaps a, a better word, but but a kind of coherence of a of a kind of a philosophy that whether we agree with that philosophy. Um, uh, as per the kind of the rise of the welfare state, or we don't agree with that philosophy as per the rise of the poor laws, um, there is a kind of coherence to the strategy that can be, you know, that that policies all hang on some sort of yeah. centralizing idea, centralized idea. Now, obviously, historians, luckily, I'm not a historian, so I don't have to question the coherence the 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 veracity of that coherence in the historical moment and of course fred i'm looking forward to you roundly disputing everything that i'm saying at the moment but what what seems to be kind of interesting in your critique um a critique i think many of us if not all of us would share um is precisely this lack of a kind of grounding uh ideological yeah um message right that it didn't and and so in a sense um and perhaps i'm just repeating things that you've said already what is compelling about the distinction between the poor laws example and the COVID 19 example is precisely that whether you like it or you don't like it at least shame was the intention of yeah. mm -hmm. the poor laws Whereas shame seems to be far more of a kind of um, a consequence or a, an unintended consequence of what happens when there is this desperate um, shortfall between uh, a kind of collection of uh, policies and a weaving of that collection of policies into some sort of coherent narrative. I mean, would you agree with that, or am I am I missing missing something in that? Yeah, no, I think I think um, I think that's uh, that's that's uh, you know absolutely right. I think that um, I think the lack of a guiding star, if you like, I think has you know a lot to answer for in this sense. I think a, a clear um, understanding of you know the sort of universal the citizenship agenda, which is a post you know, um, post-1945, um, you know, was a, a, an inspiration and remains an inspiration for things like the NHS. But over time, you know, that the power of that idea, I, unfortunately, has, has somewhat diminished. Its place has been taken by uh, an approach which has uh, emphasised, you know, if you like, the individual at the expense of the collective. Um, and you know, one of the consequences of that is that when you are faced with a, uh, a challenging situation, your point of reference is, you know, looking to the individual to remedy their ways rather than seeing how we can adapt the collective forms of, of social action, if you like, to, to deal with the, the issue um, in hand. And, uh, you know, I think that's... Um, that, that, that exactly is, in a sense, are the reasons why it's pro it produced sort of response to COVID that it did. Um, I mean, one of the comments I made on the poor law was, um, which I think is is quite interesting and actually remains, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's probably a PhD to be written by somebody here, um, about the, in 1885, we, we had the, uh, Poor or Medical Relief Disqualification Act, which basically gave people back 
their civic rights. It took away the stigma from the medical relief they received, you know, if they weren't actually living in the workhouse. So the legislation was there and was right, but the practice of delivering that was immensely difficult. And it took a very long time for people to be treated the same way across the country because of the resistance, if you like, at ground level um, to um, enfranchise, re-enfranchise these people. And I think, you know, in a sense that there's been a, there's always been that sort of um, you know, legacy of the poor, or I'm not sure you can describe it in that way, but that thread of thought that even in the high point of the welfare state has always been there. There's always been a, about, you know, discriminating against people, about singling out the undeserving. Uh, that, that's always remained a thread. And I think, you know, in a sense, you know, now we're into the 21st century, that's become more prominent. Uh, as, as a philosophy, rather than receding, as one might have hoped, you know, if one took a, a, the weak view of history, it would no longer completely disappear. But unfortunately, it's still with us, and, and perhaps COVID shows its impulse is getting a bit stronger. Ah, thank you, Ray. Um, we, we've got another question from Martin. I just know that. Um, sorry, I don't mean to monopolise the uh, <laughs> the conversation. I suppose I was just thinking through um, what what Arthur had had said there. In some ways, I was trying to think about how shame was functioning at different points. Um, and there's a there's a quote from um, I think it's from Bevan on one of the readings of the National Health Service Act was that that the NHS was there to basically enable people to practice the laws of health that the sort of so, so in some ways the idea is that you yeah. can only act and have individual responsibility if there are structures yeah. in place that meet your needs and enable you to do it and i suppose yeah. this is the one thing that um i know personally uh and I, I know other people have around this was as you pointed out the discrepancy between the, the lack of sick pay like so that's on yeah. one structure yeah. that allow people yeah. to sort of practice that yeah. And, um, you know, the welfare state, when it was initially launched, had plenty of gaps in it in terms of who was considered a citizen, who would have access to things. And I think, you know, I sort of mentioned about the diphtheria example, it would use shame in a certain way as a function, but it was always, it was linked with a provision of service in some ways, or a, a policing service that didn't necessarily go through the court, but might, require, might, might use the social worker, for instance. So there's still a kind yeah. of a disciplinary power attached, but it was not necessarily punitive and I suppose the one thing that I'd never and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts maybe a bit more on this is whether actually the way that shame has functioned within COVID is in, in some ways to one as you've mentioned sort of in some ways serve in function in place of a service or in place of a, a state provision yeah. but also to lean it much more towards a kind of a policing function which is punitive as opposed yeah. to one which is disciplinary in in some ways I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts a bit more about that. Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. I think you know that's that's certainly been the consequence. You know, and the, a bit in the in the talk where I I mentioned about all the uh, the, the actual policing functions. You know, to actually constrain people's uh, people's lives in ways that was uh, you know deemed completely um, excessive um, and uh, and divisive by the um, House of Lords, House of Commons, um, Human Rights. Um, committee, um, and there was, you know, to be to be fair, I mean, there was pushback from people on some of this stuff. I mean, people were ashamed, but there was also pushback as well. So it wasn't it wasn't all in one direction. But I think you're right. I mean, I think you touch on this point about, you know, the the, the, NH, the introduction of the NHS almost as a a sort of midwife, which enabled individuals to make the best of their lives and the best of their health. Um, in a way that we've perhaps lost sight of, and we've gone backwards in some ways. So in some ways, I'm not saying that uh, the handling of COVID, you know, is, is the same as the, what happened in the poor laws, but uh, there is no doubt that, um, you know, the, 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 the conferring of stigma or attempt to confer stigma on people who don't follow the rules, um, you know, was very powerful. And nobody seemed to be terribly interested in the reasons why. I mean, people might have very good reasons for um, not wearing a mask, to use you know, a trivial example, or 
um, you know, for, 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 not, for not doing various other things. Indeed, for not necessarily having uh, immediately accepting a vaccination. You know, I think we're, you know, we're blaming the wrong people sometimes here. I and mean, that's what this is all about, isn't it? You know, you can't, a decision to have, have a vaccination is made up of many things and not everybody is in an equal position to take advantage of that. Um, so it will be complicated for some people. But the, uh, uh, the official line doesn't seem to be, oh, well, let's explore why there's an issue here. Let's see how we can deal with the, the difficulty so that we can get more people vaccinated, more people wearing masks, you know, more people standing outside in the rain um, because it's uh, safer that way. Um, it's more, instead we point the finger, instead we, um, as you say, a punitive um, approach, which does recall those sort of days. Perhaps it recalls rather than perhaps the poor law um, in its full spate, perhaps it's more a sort of interwar thing, 20s or 30s. I mean, I know you, you know some stuff about all of this, 20s and 30s, and, and Fred likewise. But, you know, so not, not full cream poor law, but perhaps semi-skimmed might be the equivalent. Um, thank you for a, a, an unforgettable <laughs> analogy there. Um, uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to know what gold top poor law looks like. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, it's quite <laughs> special, yes. <laughs> would, um, would anyone else like to ask anything? Uh, before I, I go on to further monopolise Ray. <laughs> um, I I would I would like to know. I mean, this is this is very kind of speculative again. Um, I I suppose I'm just interested in in what you think. And um, can you can you imagine a a kind of a shame proof public health? A kind of a, a you know a, a, a culture where shaming is is not, or at least is, is as impossible as, as as it can be, and kind of like what would you, how would you kind of address shaming in public health in a kind of structural way? I mean, how would how would you get to a better place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's um, that's um, absolutely right, and I think I would. Um, Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Hannah. That's great. Um, yes, I think some of the, you know, public health as practice sort of, um, you know, in, in the sort of at the end of the last century, beginning of this century, you know, the focus on the individual health risks, um, like smoking, you know, obesity, alcohol, the rest of it, you know, it's, it's still, you know, still has a sort of, Quite a strong individual well, has an individual character, obviously, and and, and a sort of a taint of of, of shaming uh, people. Um, and actually, we know it's not you know quite that straightforward. Um, you know, there are many reasons why people might want to smoke and and, and drink, but there's not always a, a willingness to learn why that might be. And there's rather an inclination to point out the fact that this is bad for you. Um, so you know, public health in that mode can only take you so far. But I would go back to my comments ab about um, a, uh, a health-led sort of um, perspective um, for life, the sort of um, position that Michael Marmot is uh, most identified with. You know, health is about the conditions in which people, you know, were born, um, grow, live, work, and age, you know, that phrase. Um, that he that he uses in his his report, and I think that's absolutely right. And I think the, the reports that, that I mean, I was both involved in the um, the earlier Atchison inquiry on uh, health inequalities um, in uh, 1998 and 99, and then in yeah, I was the the DH lead with the um, Marmot review. Um, both of those uh, set reports set out. Uh, a program, if you like, of public health, which is probably as close as you can get to a sort of shame proof version, which is to actually recognize the way that all these different factors of life, all the conditions of living and work uh, um, and family life and so forth, uh, environment, um, combine and interact with each other. 
so that you get not a, um, a partial picture, but a rounded picture, a comprehensive picture of all the, all the different um, factors. Um, and uh, that is where, you know, you can start talking, as indeed Marmot does talk, about realising the potential of individuals and really realising the potential of communities much more positively faced so that rather than again you know placing emphasis on people you know doing something wrong and being blamed or shamed for it actually seeing how their position can be ameliorated supported helped and aided um, uh, in a way that actually gives you a, a, a shame or shame shame proof uh, approach i was minded of the you know, this comes back to the sort of thing I was talking about in terms of action being on the appropriate scale, because obviously something like um, a Marmot report or an Atchison report, um, as indeed the Black report before that, if anybody remembers the Black report from 1981, um, takes a view of society. That's what it's about. It's about creating a fairer society. That, that is, you know, it's not putting, you know, a couple of hundred million pounds here or, or there. Uh, this is a major transformation of society that is actually required, and we we seem further away from that than than ever, perhaps. But um, I, what I do, what did strike me was some uh, commentator in discussing the um, Build Back Better program, the idea of of um, rebalancing the North and the South of uh, uh, England and the UK, um, required not, you know five billion pounds here, you know, two billion pounds there. It actually required investment on the scale of the money that went into bringing East Germany up to the level of West Germany on reunification. We are talking hundreds of billions of pounds really to get there and a major commitment by a government of some kind um, to actually affect that sort of change. And while that's probably, you know, the gold standard, again, not without its flaws, it's indicative of the sort of scale of action and the focus that is required to, you know, change things, you know, long term. So, unfortunately, people tend to use the individually based public health initiatives as a bit of a sticking plaster to deal with either, you know, public panic about people drinking too much or taking too many drugs, um, put the sticking plaster on, hope that'll calm things down while the tension then focuses on something else, um, to a sort of comprehensive um, uh, uh, programme, uh, which does rather more. And, you know, I was involved in the health inequalities programme, which emerged out of Atchison. And that was, a, you know, that, a lot of that was a long term programme, much less constrained by short term economic funding. Uh, but that only highlighted to me the high degree of challenge in actually making those long-term uh, permanent changes. We can hit individual targets for inequalities, you know, which sound good, but actually getting the wider changes, which take us away from a shame-led, individual-led approach is, is actually, um, you know, much harder. Sorry, I've, I've waffled on a bit about that, but hopefully that gives you a sense of where I'm, I'm sort of coming from on that. Mm. No, no, you haven't waffled at all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else want to jump in? Um, I can ask... Uh, oh, oh, go on, Mark. Ah, two. <laughs> That's very good. I, I had a very, I had an incredibly selfish question lined up. So, so um, Martin and then Arthur. Thank you. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, well, I was wondering. Um, I was, oh, hang on. I'll put my hand down so that it doesn't get confusing. Um, I was, I was kind of thinking. So I've been, I've been reading a bit of Mary Douglas on risk and blame. Uh, so I'm kind of interested. I've been thinking a bit about the sort of political function of, of shame um, that you're sort of raising in the paper. Um, and part of me was wondering whether it's easy in some ways to sort of say that the evidence was deficient 
um, you know, the kind of particularly in these sort of evidence based policy making way. Mm. Um, and, and I do, uh, again, I was sort of just turning on some knowledge that people were in the civil service that, 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 you know, there are developments in what they call user centered design, open policy making, which is basically mm. about speaking to people. Yeah, about yeah. Their experiences with services, asking kind of why they are acting in certain ways, what they need. Um, and I, and you know my sort of experience then, and I, maybe you can correct me, is that that in some ways it was considered this was inappropriate. This is an inappropriate approach to the pandemic because of the temporality, because of the urgency, and this type of approach takes time. So at least in the early stages, there was a sense that um, uh, that you know this needs an immediate response in some ways, um, and then that kind of medium term, longer term planning that kind of went out the window. I don't know whether this is your understanding of it as well. And so whether you think one, actually, some of the kind of things around shame and um, mask wearing or vaccination or some of these other measures, aside from sort of the broader structural things, may have been approached differently if that type of evidence was introduced or whether actually the kind of the political purchase of shame in uh, in a lot of these approaches and you know people's structural position you know a lot of the civil service are coming from a particular background they would they would see the world in a particular way and, and you know you can you can have people speak but doesn't mean you're going to hear them whether you actually think yeah. those kind of things would mean the that uh, those kind of evidence wouldn't have made much difference anyway and, and sort of thinking just as a way that the government is already trying to blame people for the petrol shortage it's also yeah. blaming them for not necessarily taking the million job vacancies that are up at the moment despite it not so you know they, they're using blame and shame in other spheres yeah. and actually that would work against anyway any other type of evidence that may have been yeah. useful or introduced yeah no i think i mean i think uh you your final comments there you know rather rather sort of suggests a uh, a pattern at work here, you know, where shame uh, plays a big role. And, you know, if one was a political person, which I'm not, you know, one could say that, um, you know, the, gov the government will do anything but accept the blame and do anything to blame anybody else, um, which is not perhaps a, a brilliant place to sort of start from. So I think I think there is a difficulty there. And I think, you know, that that I think um, colours the the evidence from wherever it comes. I mean, I think you know you're absolutely right about this open policy making, asking people. You know, this is something uh, that is you know can be enormously helpful in getting policies to actually stick and have some resonance. You know, when they are when they start uh, uh, being applied. I mean, I can remember being involved with um, the cross government program on troubled families. And for our bit and our, our contribution on the health side, um, we were quite painstaking about actually having that sort of engagement with people so that when if policies were developed and published and delivered, they actually, you know, hit the spot or as near as possible. Um, and it's true, it does take time and all the rest of it. But I think it's also a state of mind. I mean, I think it's a state of mind that suggests, you know, you, do you have an open mind or a closed mind? And, you know, you've got to be willing, it seems to me. And I thought more so in a pandemic in some ways, to be open to people's ideas and responses and all the rest of it, rather than encourage them to fight amongst themselves and say, well, you know, you're to, oh, no, it's not me, it's you, you're the one that's doing it wrong. Um, and just get that mass of, of confusion. Well, and while everybody's fighting amongst themselves, you know, the government gets off sort of scot-free. Um, but, um, so I think, you know, um, you know, evidence can be, you know, coloured by that, by that. And I think the, the big handicap that the policymakers had when it came to addressing, you know, the arrival of disease X was the fact that although it was understood we had a plan, in practice, we didn't have a plan or a plan that would stand up. And there had been a... Um, neglect, uh, to probably put it, you know, put it harshly, in terms of people understanding what needed to be done. I mean, we had these various simulations um, and there were clear messages about PPE, about um, care beds, about ventilators, about hospital places. This was all set out very clearly. 
public engagement was another thing. And what happened? Nothing happened. And, you know, so it really was a case of chickens coming home to roost. So, you know, <laughs> probably gave the government an, an extra reason <laughs> to, to blame everybody else rather than sit back and, uh, and take it all itself. But, you know, I think that, that, that failure to, um, to plan and um, to do things, you know, so that, that when disease X hits, you know, you're ready to, 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 to move into to action. I mean, some of the more successful uh, countries uh, in Southeast Asia, for example, who have been closer to things like SARS and MERS and so forth, were, had a much higher state of, of readiness. I mean, I think if you recall, and I still can recall quite vividly, the, the sort of Newsnight program type programs where um, you had reports from Northern Italy, uh, which were horrifying about you know bodies being taken in great columns and coffins, you know, in in March, night twenty twenty, and politicians here thinking, well, you know, that's Italy. I mean, okay, it might have been China to start with it's Italy, well, it's all, you know, we've got the English Channel, what have we got to worry about? And there seems to be a disconnect, you know, in the in their imagination, if you like. Um, and it's that um, sense of lack of humility, I think, that is a play here. I think that, that you know, it doesn't mean you have to say, well, oh, sorry, it's all my fault. I've made all the mistakes. I've not done what I should have. I'm not, I'm not saying they have to wear you know, hair shirts and, and uh, confess to their sins. But um, there is a sense that, that, you know, if you want to have an approach which says, says we're all in this together, then people have to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge their faults. So even the best evidence, I think, in that case is, is um, you know, would, would be hard to make an impression. Uh, thanks, Ray. Um, Arthur, do you still have a question? Yeah, um, this is um, again perhaps it's it's a, it tied a little bit to Martin's question, but is also mainly because I saw a really interesting presentation recently by um, uh, an Israeli um, um, policy academic uh, who works on emotion-driven policy bubbles, and particularly the way in which um, uh, certain uh, factors will um, cause certain policies to, um, policy bubbles to form because of, because of, you know, policy bubbles are usually thought of in terms of cognitive or institutional factors, but actually, that that certain emotional sort of shared collective emotional states will will drive the developing of a policy bubble and i suppose i mean my tendency has always been to focus my criticisms on the government i'm not going to depart from my tendency but i've also been appreciative of the way in which you as 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 somebody out of the civil service have also been been very um, good about about uh, distancing yourself from any kind of criticism of any particular figures or or things like mm -hmm. that. So, so in keeping with that, I was thinking, in terms of a, whether we whether we were seeing something of an emotion driven policy bubble in um, relation to COVID or a series of of emotion driven policy bubbles where. Um, uh, the, in some ways, the policies that that were developed to respond to a kind of growing sense of panic, growing sense of um, unease, yeah. like you say, at the images that were being shown, at the at the sense of risk, at the urgency that Martin was talking about, these kinds of emotional yeah. factors. Yeah really drove um, uh, the government to have to implement policies that it was not ultimately comfortable with um, subscribing to. And because of that lack of confidence in its own policies, ultimately that generated a kind of feedback effect where it became harder and harder for people 
to really subscribe to those policies mm-hmm. um, in a long term sense. So, 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 yeah. you know, what drove the initial um, kind of uh, attachment to those policies was very much the fact that there were shared, a very uh, um, profound shared emotional sense of there being risk, there being um, uh, something being urgent, something needing to be done, and and there being a kind of an imminent catastrophe. And as that shared image dissipated, yeah, so policy should have come in to kind of fill that gap, but then didn't precisely because there wasn't the kind of belief in policy in yeah. those policies on the part of the people who were who were presenting them or promoting them yeah it should have been promoting them or i don't know i mean i, I know that this is just a re-articulation of exactly what you've been saying so i mm-hmm. so i apologize for like just stealing your presentation and saying <laughs> it again work. um yeah. but i don't know if the, any of that sort of speaks to your sense yeah no, I certainly, I mean, I certainly think, you know, I think as we were saying a bit earlier on, you know, that the lack of a belief system, the lack of a pole star, if you like, I think, um, didn't help uh, in this situation. And I think what um, 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 we've got, if we think, of, if we think of the wider political context, um, as we know, bef- immediately before um, COVID. Uh, there was another big issue that we were dealing with, which related to our relationships with our colleagues across the channel. Um, that was the big issue. And um, there's a sense in which when we're talking about emotional uh, policy bubbles, uh, there was an emotional policy bubble around issues relating to, relating to all things European uh, and a very singular uh, type of emotion, a very one dimensional type of emotion. Um, and in some senses, people, commentators have observed that, you know, this was the defining or is the defining characteristic of this uh, uh, administration. Now, translate that across to COVID, you have a set of, um, if you like, values, emotions or whatever, um, that um, when confronted with, as you say, the growing sense of panic, and I think that I, Jim, I couldn't find the, the, the public information poster to put alongside that poster which said, if you go out, people will die, um, which were basically produced within three weeks of each other. Um, the, the contrast was uh, absolutely striking. Um, and I think it did reflect that sense of, oh, my God, and particularly when the prime minister had to then go into hospital, you know, um, that anticipated that. So I think what happened was, in a sense, the people, uh, you know, the, the, this particular policy bubble resorted to its default mode, which was basically a sort of, um, well, one phrase that comes to mind, hostile environment, for example, which is a phrase often associated with with some of the the, the, the politicians engaged in this. And I think they transferred a lot of that um, sense to this particular policy because that's what they that's how they knew how to handle other policy issues so i think there's probably roots um from covid which you can trace back to what was happening in in europe what was happening in um immigration and crime policies i I don't think this is a sort of one-off i think you know it is it is as a part of a pattern and it's a it's a, a a belief system which is perhaps different from what you know, post welfare state times, um, it, you know, it's sort of where we are now. But um, I think that that idea of, you know, we may not be all in it together as a country, as a nation or whatever, but certainly the people at the top table making the decisions were all in it together and had a very common, you know, singular view of the world, which I think, you know, drove a lot of you know, policy. So I hope I didn't veer too much into political territory there, but but um, uh, I think that that will be my feeling about that. Thank you. Uh, there's there's really nothing more political than being a political. Um, <laughs> I, I I was going to ask a question, but I've I've really decided it's it was just so kind of staggeringly selfish. Um, 
uh, that I can't possibly hold you all hostage uh, while I ask Ray something that I can definitely just ask him later down the line. Um, so unless anyone has a final question, I think we'll leave it there today. Oh, we've got one. Um, so uh, this is from Maria Teresa Marangoni, and she says, uh, do you think that blaming and shaming is going to be used extensively in relation to the climate crisis? Yeah. Well, I mean, as I was just saying, I think, you know, the roots of the sort of blaming and shaming for COVID, you know, we can track them back to um, other policies, um, or, or, you know, post sort of, you know, 2017, 2019. I think in, in, this, in the same way, we can probably look forward to think about climate change in a, in a, a not un, un, unsimilar situation. I mean, I think it, it does raise um, some issues. Um, you know, I mean, one of the comparisons I know, I know, that I know has been drawn is with smoking and tobacco. And uh, the fact that governments of, of both varieties found it easier to blame the smokers rather than blame the tobacco industry. And I think the same conundrum is gonna face the government in relation to climate change. It's gonna probably find it, uh, especially after uh, the COP26 or whatever, the big Glasgow conference is coming up next month, it's gonna find it easier to uh, blame individuals if it needs to get its um, act together or raise its profile rather than to address you know some of those again some of the structural issues around the the big players in, in climate change so you know i don't think covid is the end of blaming and shaming far from it i think we'll it's going to be a, a recurrent theme um thank you very much Ray. um with a, a really really good place to leave it with kind of thoughts for the future um so yeah, once again, I'd like to say a huge thank you to, to Ray for an absolutely fantastic talk um, and, and a big thank you to uh, everyone for, for coming and for asking questions um, and for being a lovely, attentive audience. So um, thank you. Um, and yeah, I think that's the time. So see you soon. Thanks very much. Thanks, Fred. Bye. Bye, everyone.